Welcome back. This is episode 226 of the Veterinary Business video show. In this episode, we'll hear some advice about rewarding employees that do a great job, and we'll learn something about what makes a leader. We'll see how to motivate staff by setting them smart goals. We'll learn why top performers do less, work better, and achieve more. And I'll offer you my quick business tip for this episode. I'm John Shoden, and this is the video show from Veterinary Business. I no longer have any employees, but I can well imagine how difficult and costly it can be to recruit and retain team members with the skills, commitment and attitude that you're looking for. There's a clear link between the long-term stability of your practice team and the long-term retention of your client database. So keeping great employees is an important business objective for any practice owner. That raises a number of issues about how they should be paid and to what extent salary increases could or should be based on merit, on long-term service or on both. Here's a clip in which Joel Parker of Veterinary Practice Solutions offers some advice about rewarding employees that do a great job and what to do with the ones that don't. And this week we're talking about how to pay your staff and how to reward the ones that do a job above and beyond the others and what to do with the ones that aren't kind of really pulling up their socks on. There's been a really interesting thing that's kind of crept into the workplace in the last 30 or 40 years and it has to do with tenure. That just, some, just because somebody has been at your practice for 20 years that they deserve a raise every year and that they deserve a raise for being there a long time. Now, I really love people staying around. I don't like a lot of staff turnover. Over. It's kind of unsettling. You've got to train new people. So don't get me wrong on that. I love long-term employees, but it can never be at the point. Like, let me put it this way. The, the number of years they've been there can never outweigh things that they do and how they're getting paid for it. The bottom line is, is that when you pay somebody well for a job done well, it matches up perfectly. If you pay somebody up here for a job down here, then you know that there's something not right. And actually, believe it or not, your employees know it too, that they're getting overpaid. If on the other hand, you, you know, you're paying them way down here with the performance up here, then they know that as well. So the bottom line is, as human beings, we know if something's not fair. So the bottom line is, is to break out in your practice a commensurate pay system. Commensurate, commensurate means equal to what something was done. So this week we're talking about commensurate pay for a job done. And the trick on this here is number one, define what the job is. Define the actions of what it is. Define what you need to do. Define what those expe expectations are, those actions are to that job. Be very specific in your policy book, in your playbook, just like on a football team. Secondly, define the performance expectations. You know, what is something, you know, what, what can a new surgeon do? What do you expect of a veterinary uh, surgeon when they come in or an associate doctor when they come in? How many hours a week you're expecting to work? How many surgeries a day? Things like that. And then develop your pay system commensurate with the performance of one and two. So that way, you're paying people well based on products that are done, completed cycles that are done, okay? So that there's no problems that need to be done, the whole thing is wrapped up. So an example of this would be, you're gonna pay a veterinarian well who comes in and does surgery, uh, doesn't leave the surgical room a mess, does the surgery perfectly, updates the notes and records and updates the bill. There's nothing else that needs to be done. That cycle is complete and it's a beautiful thing. So start looking around at who your real team players are. What I like about, for example, the ProSal uh, method of paying veterinarians is that there is a base salary they get, but when they really perform, then they can bump it up into that extra little bit of income that comes in. And not that we're practicing veterinary medicine with the sole purpose to make money. It's just more the reward that comes in with it. Now let's see who's on the video show, Soapbox. Inspired by the Vet Futures Project, the RCVS has set up an important initiative to meet its strategic ambition to become a Royal College with leadership at its heart. Of course, the success of any organisation depends to a great extent on the availability and quality of its leader or leaders and emotional intelligence is said to be one of the characteristics which sets great leaders apart from the rest. What makes a leader is the title of this clip from the Harvard Business Review. What distinguishes great leaders from just adequate ones? It isn't IQ or technical ability. 
It's emotional intelligence, the ability to monitor your feelings and those of others to guide your thinking and behavior. Technical skills and smarts do matter, of course, but emotional intelligence is twice as important for jobs at all levels. And in the top tier, it accounts for nearly 90% of the difference between average and star performers. Studies also show a strong link between emotional intelligence and bottom line results. At one company, divisions whose senior managers scored high in emotional intelligence beat their yearly earnings goals by 20%. Divisions without such leaders underperformed by almost as much. Psychologist Daniel Goleman identified five components of emotional intelligence. The first is self-awareness. This means thoroughly understanding yourself and your effect on others. For example, a self-aware person who struggles with deadlines plans ahead. Self-aware employees welcome feedback. Another sign is a self-deprecating sense of humor, people who admit to failure easily and with a smile. Self-aware people know their abilities and play to their strengths, but they don't overreach and aren't afraid to ask for help. Leaders who see themselves clearly also see their companies clearly, but it's easy to overlook self-awareness when sizing up potential leaders. You might assume that someone who admits to shortcomings isn't tough enough to lead, when in fact the opposite is true. Leaders must constantly judge capabilities, in themselves and in others. The second component of emotional intelligence is self-regulation, controlling disruptive impulses and thinking before acting. For example, a manager whose team has botched a big presentation might want to pound the table in anger, but if he has a gift for self-regulation, he'll consider the reasons for the failure share his thoughts with the team, and propose a solution. Leaders who control their feelings create an atmosphere of fairness and trust. This reduces politics and infighting, so productivity is higher. It also draws talented people in and curbs unethical behavior. If there's one trait that virtually all great leaders have, it's motivation, the third component of emotional intelligence. Motivated people are driven to achieve beyond expectations, not for money or status, but because they're passionate about their work. Motivated people also want to be stretched and are always raising the performance bar. And they're optimistic, even when the going gets tough. Someone who sets the bar high for himself will do the same for his company, and the drive to exceed goals is often contagious. We've all seen the fourth component, empathy, in a sensitive teacher or a friend. Empathetic people read between the lines of what's said, and this makes them especially good at understanding and supporting group dynamics. Empathy doesn't mean trying to please everybody. That's impossible. But it does mean considering other people's feelings when making decisions. Empathy is more crucial now than ever for three reasons. The prevalence of teams, the rapid pace of globalization, and the growing need to attract and retain talent. Teams are cauldrons bubbling with emotions, and a leader has to make sense of all of them, if the team is going to collaborate well. Empathy is also paramount in the global economy. Misunderstandings can flare up quickly when people's basic assumptions differ, and empathy provides an antidote. Empathetic people have a good feel for cultural differences and gain understanding from body language and other cues. Empathy is also crucial to retaining talent. Studies show that coaching and mentoring pay off not just in performance, but also in increased satisfaction and decreased turnover. The last component of emotional intelligence is social skill. This isn't simply friendliness, it's friendliness with a purpose, and it draws on all of the other four components. Socially skilled people are great at building and leading teams. That's their empathy at work. They're also expert persuaders because their self-awareness, self-regulation, and empathy tell them when to make an emotional plea, for instance, and when to appeal to reason. And they're excellent collaborators. Their passion for the work spreads to others, and their motivation drives them to find solutions. Remember that social skill can be tricky to spot. You might think an employee chatting in the hall is wasting time. Maybe he's talking to someone who isn't even connected to his job. But socially skilled people don't arbitrarily limit their relationships. They know they might need help tomorrow from someone they are just meeting today. You probably know people who are strong in some of the five areas of emotional intelligence, but sadly lacking in others. This raises the question, is emotional intelligence a fixed quality, or can it be learned? Now for a tip from the top in the business world of veterinary practice. I'm pretty sure that most of you are well aware of the need to establish marketing and other business objectives by following the letters of the SMART 
acronym. Here's a clip in which Leila Bulling Town reminds us that motivating staff can also be much more effective by establishing and communicating smart goals. As a manager, do you spend a lot of time telling an employee what to do again and again? If so, you probably haven't written smart goals for that person. You're being judged by how well your team performs, so have you actually told them what to do? If not, come on managers, it's time to write SMART goals. Here's how to do it. Tip 1. Describe the task using SMART language. SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Action-Oriented, Realistic, and Time-Bound. And you should use all these descriptions when writing and communicating a goal. For example, Joan, I need you to complete your weekly sales report by Monday 12 noon. In that report, include client calls and progress you have made against quarterly targets. Tip 2. Make the connection between the big company goals and the individual SMART goals. Don't assume an employee knows how her tasks roll up to the big picture. Connect the dots for her. Tell the employee how her work is going to affect the whole company. Doing so will motivate her. For example, Joan, when you accomplish this task, you help the company meet its quarterly revenue goals. Tip three, repeat, repeat, repeat. This isn't a one-time thing. To help your team know what to do and how to do it, you need to repeat the message often. Reinforce SMART goals by repeating them and checking in with employees during weekly one-on-one -on -one and group meetings. Never assume you're over-communicating about goals. No one will accuse you of spending too much time talking about what they need to get done. Remember, managers are evaluated by the work of their teams. If you don't explain to your employees in SMART language what needs to be accomplished, they're not going to figure it out on their own. It's as simple as that. Now for my quick business tip for this episode. My business tip today is one which I should have learned and followed at the beginning of my career. By now it's probably too late for me. Why? Because as one of my colleagues told me years ago, John, your big problem is that you're not focused enough. Here's a clip in which Dan Pink is chatting to Morton Hansen, author of his new book, which explains how top performers do less, work better, and achieve more. Hi everyone, welcome to another PinkCast. I am here in Memphis, Tennessee with Morton Hansen, who is a professor of management at the University of California, Berkeley, and the author of Great at Work. And he is here from Western Tennessee with one tip about how you can do that very thing become great at work. Morton, what do you got? Hi, Dan. Top performers in our study did one thing. They do less than obsess. Oh, okay. It means two things. First of all, you've got to go all in on one or two or maximum three things. Okay. Hyper focus right. is really important. And that's get rid of the other stuff. Absolutely. Say no, get rid of stuff. Okay. And then the second thing is that you need to go all in. You need to obsess. That's the obsess. And that means fanatic attention to detail, go for quality, do, go the extra mile, do exceptional work in those few things. So top performers are doing two things right. They're hyper-focused and they go all in. Great. So this is great advice, uh, Pinkcast viewers. Sometimes subtraction beats addition. Do less and obsess, and you too can be great at work. Thanks for watching the Pinkcast. I count myself as very lucky to have been a proud member of my profession well over half a century, and although I may not have been focused for long enough on any particular topic, I've never found the need to consider what's often described as my work-life balance. Work for me is simply an op important part of doing what I want to be doing in my life. What do you need to do in your life to be able to, do, to say the same? Well, that's about it for now. I'm John Sheridan, and this has been another video show from Vetri Business. See you next time.